Good evening. Oh, sorry, that's very loud. We appreciate you all being here tonight. We'll go ahead and start tonight's meeting. Call to order. And roll call, Dr. Thomason. Good evening, Madam President. Please let the record show that all board members are present tonight. Thank you. We have our Pledge of Allegiance, and we'll follow with our moment of silence. Oh, by the way. I'm sorry. Sorry, we're going to do our moment of silence first. That was. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> I'll go ahead and move that we approve tonight's agenda. Second. Is there any comments or questions regarding the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five point zero. We have a request to speak to the governing board. ARS dash thirty eight dash four three one dot oh one dot H. This time has been set aside for anyone who would wish to address the audience or who wishes to address the board. Please remember this is not an appropriate venue to evaluate, discuss, or criticize district personnel. Policy KEB allows for that process, and that can be found on the district website on the home page. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically on the agenda. Phil Alibrandi. And please limit your remarks to three minutes. I may go short for a change. President Whitener, members of the board, Dr. Thomason, staff, members of the community. Some people have not been able to follow um, some recent information, some of it in the press release, and some of it in a uh, article from the Arizona Republic about the voter informational pamphlets that are coming out from the KESA, or the Maricopa County Education Service Agency. Uh, as everyone knows, when we have ballot measures for overrides, you can have 10 positive and 10 uh, anti-statements bonds are a different issue and those are unlimited. Sadly, we found out in the middle of August that of the 10 Higley override pro statements, four of them were in fact fraudulent. Um, this has been, it's in the press, there's actually been an investigative reporter who's about to release something on Friday and they've actually discovered a connection between three of the four. So it'll be interesting on Friday when you read that in the paper. What's interesting is we engaged with not only McKessa, but based on the way the statute was written, we were not able to get them to remove these fraudulent statements. This is not a freedom of speech issue. It's not because of what they said was against what we believe or what anyone believes. It was an issue of people misidentifying themselves, having improper addresses, not writing their names properly, et cetera, et cetera. And it took some digging to find these people and where they really were. People who lived in apartments, who lived in Mesa, or even in our district, so it was confusing to us why they would even care. It turns out the two of the same fraudulent people in our override pamphlet are in the Gilbert override pamphlet as well. And their third fraud person, a Miss Jessica, turns out to be the mother of one of the other people. So you'll see all this on Friday in the next article that comes out. The point is the public needs to be aware that we're gonna work with the legislature. I've already asked Representative Peterson to perhaps uh, help me draft this legislation that the statute is pretty clear right now that the McKessa is not allowed to remove statements for any reason. So you could say you're Ronald McDonald and lived at McDonald's on Bell Vista and Warner and they would still have to leave it in. They don't have the power to remove fraudulent statements. That's what we're gonna work on. We're not gonna try to change anyone's opinion. Um, and if people wanna write satire, that's fine. But if you're writing satire and you're against something, then you should be listed as a con statement, not as a pro statement because good satire can be an effective way of swaying public opinion as well. So that's where we stand right now. And uh, the county attorney, Mr. Montgomery, was incredibly helpful. Uh, we spoke for about 30 minutes one night. Uh, his hands were tied based on the statute. 
but he did what he could to include having that terrific uh, press conference where he specifically cited and spent about eight to ten minutes on the Higley issue out of his 30-minute uh, presentation. So we appreciate what uh, Mr. Montgomery and his office have done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Walker, do you have any more comment? Or? Thank you. 6.0, Superintendent's Report. Dr. Thomason. Good evening, President Whitener. Um, at this time, Dr. Nance will give us an update on the Bridges Elementary School. President Whitener, members of the board, this is a very quick update. I promised I would come back to you once the students have spoken, and we now have a mascot and colors for Bridges Elementary School. I apologize that the colors don't come out exactly the way they're supposed to up on this slide. But members of the Bridges community will find it very easy to purchase attire that matches their school colors because there's a lot of maroon and gold out there if you go into the stores. That will be very easy. And the students, through a voting process and narrowing it down, they had originally made all kinds of suggestions, had a couple of rounds of voting to narrow it down, and, and the majority went to the Bobcats. So we now have Bridges Elementary Bobcats ready to go next year. Thank you. I do know I, I have seen, I, I know somehow it's getting out there because I've seen on social media um, parents calling on each other, hey, come. I, I come. think the students were well aware of it yeah. pretty soon after the voting. Uh, the, the students who participate in this are all students at Power Ranch Elementary School. We know we have a few other students that live in that neighborhood scattered amongst our other schools and attending other schools in the district. One of the things we did over the past couple of weeks, which is, is kind of interesting, is we put a link on the web page that asks families who do not have children in our district schools but who intend to have children at Bridges to go on and give us their information and I, we've gotten a number of those already I think within the first day we had about 30 already and I don't know how many we've had since then but we have a number of families that have said we've moved into the Bridges in the last few months we didn't want to change schools twice. We're waiting for the new school to open. So now we're able to collect that information. We also had the link put, I believe, there's a Bridges social media page and a Bridges community newsletter. We're trying to go at it that way as well. So it's kind of fun to collect that new family information. Thank you. That was going to be my next question is how are we reaching those families that aren't necessarily in That's the best we can do right now is the word of mouth and having them respond to us because we don't know how to reach out to them individually. Can we have little flyers in the model homes? We already do. Will that have those links now? I A separate piece of with paper? Mrs. With Michelle, I think we're very, we have that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dr. Thomason, are we ready for some awards? Yes, next uh, we have our monthly points of pride. So at this time, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Terry Wadawa to uh, uh, do her points of pride for Williamsfield High School. Dr. Wadawa. Okay. <laughs> okay, the board's gonna take those front seats, so you don't have to stare at us at the wall. And, um, and please introduce um, the recipients of the awards. Can we introduce their families and those who are here to support them? Kind of like getting ready for the um, Academy Awards. A bit. If I could have Mr. Stephen Markling join me up here, please. You can just stand to the side of me, Stephen. Um, which microphone should I use? This one? This one. This one? Okay. All right. Stephen is a senior this year at Williamsfield, um, and I've had the, ple the good pleasure to get to know him over the past three years. Uh, Stephen is a multi-talented and well-rounded young man, which is what we hope and, and aspire for all of our students to be. He is in honors classes, AP in dual enrollment, challenges himself on a, on a yearly basis, sometimes with a little reticence, I think, um, 
according to your mother, anyway. Uh, but still comes through it and does very exceedingly well. He's also a member of our Black Hawk Regiment, so I, I wore my shirt tonight to represent. Um, he is a section leader for our percussion and is a very talented musician in his own right, um, has, com has tried out and competed in summer um, marching the... the marching, I don't want to say leagues, they're the drum corps, thank you, um, and has been very successful with that. And he's also come back and given to our students in our community. He's reached out to our, our young Blackhawks at HTA and Chaparral and Gateway Point and also Coronado. So in all of this, he encompasses what we believe to be the very best, the point of pride um, as a Blackhawk. And I, again, am, I, I am very honored to know him and to be his principal. So congratulations, Stephen. And Fitch. No, no, not yet. Oh. Light your candy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys stand up here. Um, and Governing Board, President Martin, would you like us to make these people stand up here as well? All right, so Martha and Plan, would you stand up here? Next up, Ms. Beverly Peden, would you join me? <laughs> Ms. Peden has the, the fortune or the misfortune of um, being our student government sponsor as well as our AP World History instructor as well as the department chair for social studies at Williams Field High School. And over the past three years, again, as I've come to know Stephen, um, there are things I can count on when I, when I work with Bev. It will be done right, it will be done efficiently, and she does not disappoint. Um, this past two years, she's taken over as our student government advisor, and it was a tall challenge, I think we can all agree. Um, and this year, she's kind of doing it solo. She had a partner the year before who, unfortunately, her that, that person's husband is in um, Howard Medical School, so that she lost her work spouse. However, she's not skipped a beat in terms of anything that she's done. We had an outstanding homecoming celebration. The kids are learning the importance of leadership, and it's through the guidance and, and really the situations that Ms. Peden has set up for, for those students. Um, in, in terms of instruction in the classroom, second to none, she's developing our students reading and writing and thinking skills, and she's certainly demonstrating leadership on every level. So it is with great appreciation that I thank her for all that she does, and she is our point of pride at, for teaching. Thank you. Would you like to introduce your family? Come on up, family. <laughs> they didn't know they were going to be brought up. <laughs> I like to see her face. <laughs> this is um, my husband Adam, and this is my oldest son Cole, and my youngest son Peter. And he goes to two.
Mr. Paul Lembeck, would you join me up here, please? It's football season, so I can't <laughs> got two games tomorrow. Sorry to interrupt that. <laughs> it's okay. All right. You're 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 dressed for the for the for the evening. Um, Mr. Lembeck is our equipment manager at Williams Field, and he came, um, and he's also a parent of a, a Black Hawk as well, um, came in a mid, mid-season replacement um, and hit the ground running and has done phenomenally in terms of organization, making sure things are where they need to be, but also problem solving. You know, it's we have a situation where we've got tight budgets and going back and replacing things is not always easy to do. We had a, a situation not too far back where we had some kids work in a chain gang for a football game and they didn't move when they were supposed to and some poles got bent and I went and priced out new poles and it's about 10 grand. Hmm. Dr. Wadawa doesn't have that in her budget. Um, but thankfully, I. I went to Paul, and he was able to find a solution for that. And that's just one example of the of the things that he does um, for the school and for the kids, really. And, I, again, I can't say enough good things about him. I don't know what I would do without you. I know the coaches don't know what they would do without you. And certainly our student-athletes appreciate everything that you do, Paul. Um, so we are glad that you are our point of pride and that you are a Blackhawk. So here you are. Family, come on up. Wife, Vanessa, and my two-year-old daughter, Marty. Yeah, don't see the daddy. And last, but certainly not least, Mrs. Michelle Custer. So um, when I became principal at Williams Field, I had this great group of parents that met me about the third day on the job and said, hey, we're your ambassadors club. And this lady was leading the charge. Um, we're here. We're here to help. help tell us how you can make um, how we can make your life easier. And at that point, I didn't know what I was doing, so I couldn't really give them any useful tips on how to make my life easier. But what I will say is, is Ms. Custer, led by, in conjunction with her husband and led by a great team, has truly helped the teachers and the students at Williams Field thrive and, and feel appreciated, which in these times is so very important. Um, grant writing, setting up paper drives, uh, finding ways, you, new and unique ways to, to make money for the school and really remind the community and also the teachers that, that there is somebody on their side and that they want, uh, they want to make Williams Field a great place to be. I don't know how I would do it without you. I truly mean that. So maybe Riley needs to stay another year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well then, you, you just got to come back and visit. But truly, uh, we appreciate everything that you do, Michelle. Thank you. Mr. Custer, would you join us as well? This is Mr. Jim Custer, her partner in crime, and her husband. Thank you. President Whitener, members of the board, I want to introduce and talk about Estevan Fierro. I believe he is not here this evening. 
Um, he's in our transportation department. He's been with the district for 13 years he, as an assistant mechanic. He's had four different directors of transportation. And um, he, when uh, Dr. Thomas and I went over and met him and recognized him with, with, his, with, uh, with Josh, um, we were just impressed. He's a very hard worker, and if there's a job that needs to get done, he makes sure that it gets, gets taken care of. Um, if he's watching back at home, um, we want to recognize him tonight. And uh, the other piece to note, even though he's an assistant mechanic, he also is a bus driver. And so at any kind of moment, if he needs to put the wrench down and head out on a run, he does that for us as well. So we want to recognize him tonight. I think he was, he's one of those behind-the-scenes kind of guys that doesn't really want the spotlight. So we want to recognize him but uh, let you know that... that uh, that he was recognized at, at the transportation department. So Esteban Fierro is the points of pride for transportation. Thank you. Next, to tell us a little bit of our advanced placement updates is Dr. Uh, McCulley. President Whitener, members of the board, good evening. Tonight I'm going to update you on the AP scores from the advanced placement spring testing in 2015. And if the technician <laughs> Would mind advancing the slides for me? This will go a lot faster. If he heard me, could he put a thumb up back there? Oh, thank you. Okay. Go ahead and advance beyond. Okay, so here's our five-year trends. As you know, we uh, have been working diligently, the Educational Services Department, on building our advanced placement programs. And you can see from 2011 to now, just how much we've grown. Um, the first box is Higley High, and you can see that they had growth again. Um, and I really want you to look at the last row there for them, the percent of total students. Um, they went up a couple of percent. Now, why is that significant in the number of students meeting uh, the, the, the benchmark of a three or higher? Uh, because actually statewide and globally, that, number, that percentage went down, so Higley High, good job. The other thing I want to point out is if you look at Williams Field, they had a significant um, jump in students and uh, test takers. So what you'll see there is usually when we uh, expand access to programs such as this, we will see a dip in scores, and you see that there with Williams Field, but in a few years that'll stabilize and uh, you'll see growth starting to occur. Um, Arizona, like I said, and globally, you saw uh, some growth in students uh, that uh, H Higley High matched pretty well, but Williams Field had growth that was well beyond what you see state and uh, uh, nationally. And we're kind of a microcosm of the state, so you can almost look at those numbers and move your decimal over and see that comparison. Next slide. There's a visual display for people who like their data in bars. That was a retro joke. Okay, next slide. <laughs> All right, this is what we're really proud of here. Um, the scholars. Each year, the uh, College Board provides us with a report that tells us how many students um, qualified as AP scholars, how many were an AP scholar with honor, with distinction, and how many qualified as, as uh, national AP scholars. And um, it wasn't until two years ago that we even had any national AP scholars. And so this year we actually had four, or last year we had four. Um, what I'm really excited about is one of those students was a junior last year. And so we'll be bringing them probably uh, October, November-ish in to, to recognize. We kind of wanted them to have some, not a lot of other 
distractions around so we could really get them in. Um, next slide. Equity and excellence. So this is the uh, where we measure how are we providing, are we broadening that access, and you can uh, and and in so doing, are we getting better at the percentage of students who are uh, earning the the three or higher? And so what you can see the graduating class, a culmination of their um, scores. You'll have a, a for the district we have 24 percent of the seniors who scored a three or better on one at any point in high school and then you could see just last year it's broken down by grade for just what percent last year alone so if they took a test last year as a 12th grader that's the percent that had a three or better across um, on at least one it's divided by the number of students so these percentages that's really high usually you see those more in like the 10 to 15 Sorry, I didn't clarify that. It's the percent of your actual class of students in that cohort. So a quarter of them in AP is almost unheard of. Even you see the 10th grade, it's 8% and that'll climb each year. Okay, and that is all. Like I said, we wanna bring the students in to really, really acknowledge them and uh, make a big deal, especially since we have a national scholar who can actually come this year because he or she is not already in college or on a mission or doing something else because they've graduated. Do you have any questions? Thank you. I would just like to say, I don't think people under realize in the community that where college is going now that between high school and college the line is fading a lot um, so the students now are coming into college with up to a year of credits secondary sophomore credit so it's very important that the students do the AP and dual enrollment because this, this is the competition I think many years ago it was the um, head start for kindergarten you know to prepare the students and now what we're seeing at the other end for graduation is the students that are coming into the universities with AP and dual enrollment and comparing yep. with the students who don't so this is really nice in reference to seeing our numbers increase in it is and this doesn't capture all of the the courses either so and uh, when we do an accountability update later I'll really blow your mind when I show you how many of our students are actually enrolled in college and career ready courses deemed by the Arizona Department of Education as qualifying. That's very, very important. I know I'm at Chandler Gilbert Community College and they just showed the statistics for last week and from the Queen Creek, Chandler and Higley and Gilbert schools, there's over 4,000 high school seniors that are attending dual enrollment just at that one college. So that's, that's incredible. It's great that they're getting it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thomason, would you like to go over upcoming events? Yes, upcoming events. Uh, next week, uh, we have our fall break that goes from September 28th to October 9th, followed by uh, District Gilbert Chamber of Commerce Good Government, Good Government Series Roundtable that will be held here at the district office on October 20th at 7.15 a.m. Uh, I hope all the board members are able to make it to that and the community and um, patrons also. Then we have the work study and the next board meeting on October 21st, followed the next day by the Mayor's Ambassador Forum at Gilbert Council Chambers, uh, downtown Gilbert, for those that would like to, a mayor update. And then our Veterans Day celebration on November 5th, where the Hickley Unified School District will be teaming up with the town of Gilbert this year to have a Veterans Day celebration. So that would be the upcoming event for the next month. Thank you. Are there any other, uh, any other events that we need to be aware of or any board comments tonight? Sure, I'd just like to share, I think uh, all the board members, when we went to Williamsfield uh, homecoming and we went also to Higley High School homecoming, so congratulations to both schools on that. Um, this is Reese and myself went to on a tour of uh, Higley High School for in the morning last Thursday, visited the classrooms. Uh, we had lunch with some seniors and it was a wonderful opportunity. I know Ms. Reese and I had a great time and met with the students and the staff and I'd just like to publicly thank them for sharing their day with us. 
Thank you. President Whitener. Ms. Reese. Like Mr. Rotovich said, we spent some time at Higley High School, and it was, it was really, it was a fun morning. But the students, when they found out that board members come to their events, they were really surprised, and they were very appreciative that they have board members who care about them, and that care about their school, and that we want to be there to support them, and. After we had lunch with them that evening, Higley High School had their Beat the Heat run, and I was there, and immediately someone from student council came up and said, hi, I met you today, thank you for coming. I know you said you would, but you're here. And I said, yeah, I told you I would, I'm here. And they said, you know, they were just very grateful, and then I um, went to their tailgating festivities for their homecoming. And again, another student council person, someone completely different. You said you were gonna be here and you're here, look it. And, and I said, yes, we, you know, we do come out and support you. And, and even if you don't know, a lot of times there is a board member at, at a lot of those events. And they were very, very appreciative. So that was fun. Um, Lots of events went to the Sossman Championship game yesterday. It was a little sad, but <laughs> the only game they lost was their championship game. So that was in flag football. Um, and like Mr. Rotovich said, we were all there for homecoming. And, and it was, it's, been, it's been a busy couple weeks, but it's been good. So, just a reminder, we don't have school on October 12th either. So... All right, thank you. I also wanted to mention they had a great turnout as well at the uh, foundation, had the uh, scholarship, the golf outing last Saturday, and had a great turnout with the community and raised a lot of funds for scholarships for the Higley students, so that was nice. And Dr. Thomason was there as well with us. Thank you. Yes, please, <laughs> please relay to them. Thank you, Dr. Thomason, for their efforts in, in continuing that event. Okay, at this time we have the consent agenda items. I will move that we approve 7.1 through 7.9. I'll second. Is there any questions or discussion on those items? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. There's no, there is not any old business at this time. We'll move on to 9.0. We have some presentation information items 9.1 we have a presentation on some of our high school career and technical education programs thank you Video Mr. Whitener. Production programs. at this time I'd like to invite up uh, Annette Schmidt our CTE coordinator to the podium to talk to us a little bit about what's going on with our CTE programs and uh, some of the cuts that we talked about earlier um, during the work study that we're looking at for next year in CTE so first, we have a student with us. This is um, Mazar Bagrami. I'm gonna invite him to come on up. He's gonna tell us a little bit about his program. We actually have, um, Mazar, you can come on up. We have seven programs with 15 teachers and between the two high schools. And Mazar is gonna tell you about his, the TV or video production program and a little bit about that. And then we're gonna see a video about that. First of all, hello everyone. My name is Mazar Bogrami. Nice to meet you. Mrs. Whitener, we've met before, but uh, what I said to you was guac is extra on your burrito bowl. Anyway, that's a Chipotle <laughs> reference. <laughs> anyway. Where at? This was at the Chipotle. Chipotle. Don't worry, we all look alike back there. Be in the kitchen. <laughs> Anyway, we're not here to talk about Chipotle, even though it's great, we know. Thank you for eating at Chipotle, we love you all. Anyway, this isn't about who wore the best tie. <clears throat> and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a Mr. Steven who left, who uh, did a lot of crazy college stuff and a lot of great stuff, but I did do one thing that makes me sleep well at night. I'm in the studio, oh. I'm in the studio at Higley High School, which is a video production program, a three-year course, a intro, intermediate, and advanced. These are two semester classes, so intro to 
semesters, intermediate, two semesters, and advanced, which is our studio program. This is basically storytelling, communication skills. Did I say storytelling already? Did I say that one? Yeah. And career technical education skills, basically holding a camera and telling a story, telling a visual story through a lens. Do we have the video ready? Hey, we do. Can we press play, please? Please. And please enjoy the video. My name is Dave Nuttall. I've been here at Higley High School as the film and TV production instructor for nine years. During the time that I've been the instructor here, my students have experienced an extremely high level of success. My students have earned four national film awards and a handful of local and state um, competitions and film festivals. It's been exciting to see what they take from what we cover in class and then be able to take that into the real world and, and get recognized for it outside of the classroom. When I think about my students and where I want them to be after they leave my classroom, I, of course, I think it would be great if the next Steven Spielberg came out of my classroom or the next great news anchor came out of my classroom. And I've had students over the last nine years that have gone to film school, they have gone to TV broadcasting programs, they have completed those programs and they're doing quite, quite well for themselves today. There's two brothers that I had eight or nine years ago that have their own media firm in Seattle. And so it's exciting always to see those experiences. However, the reality is most of the students in my classroom are not going to end up in a film career. And to me, that is okay. Some of the things that I want to make sure that my students come away with when they leave my classroom is I want to make sure that they understand how to be a leader. I want to make sure that they understand how to work in a team environment. They're going to be organized. They're going to commu communicate at a high level, um, both written and orally. That's something that um, through the through the experiences that they are having in this classroom, they're going to stand in front of a camera. And whether they, whether they end up using a camera in their profession someday is irrelevant to me. They're going to, they're going to know how to present information in a way that is understandable to the people that they're working with, to potential clients, and that's going to make them successful. They're going to learn how to work with deadlines. All of us, regardless of the career that you're in, you're going to be expected to be getting a job done at a sp by a specific time. And most of all, I want to make sure that they, when they leave this class, that they have a high expectation for themselves and the people that, that they work with. I want them to hold themselves to a high level of accountability that they can perform their job, whatever that job is, to a very high level. My name is Ashley Brown, and I'm a junior at Higley High School enrolled in the video production program. Ever since I was younger, I really had a passion for videography and photography and saw it as a great opportunity to really enhance my skills and be able to work with professional equipment. I got started in video production so that I can be able to apply skills that I could be able to use in a future career. What I love about the class is that we really get free reign to use any ideas and to really bring it to life and play it out. We can use any, um, we have access to all these equipment, to the editing software, which is really nice. I love how independent I get to be into this class and how I can be a leader in my group. I can work with others to get the job done. I like that anything that we can come up with, we can make it, we can put it on the screen. My name is Jason Karcher. I teach TV broadcasting at Williamsville High School. I hope my students gain just a, a sense of accountability, you know, that, that hard work always pays off. It may not be tomorrow, it may not be next Tuesday, but eventually it'll pay off. And I hope they learn to compromise. You know, it's, it's group work, you know, and that's when you get in the real world and real life experiences that you're not always going to get exactly what you want. You got to accept it for what it is and move on. So basically just accept diversity. You know, it's not always going to be perfect. The biggest thing is communication. Uh, they have their own folders, their own files. They file their, their own stuff. It's basically, they're kind of an employee. They get graded off of their folders, their work. And I think that's such a huge life skill to learn is because it keeps, it keeps them organized. It keeps them uh, accountable and they learn time management. My name is Erin Tucker. I am a junior here at Women's Field High School and I am in TV broadcasting. I started TV broadcasting uh, because I saw that it was listed here at Williams Field and I was curious, I wanted to try it out because 
my aunt and I would make home videos and we really enjoy that. I'm learning social skills, how to conduct interviews if I need to, learning how to do all the different kinds of footage that you need to get for filming. I really enjoy using equipment and getting to know the people, especially people I work well with. <laughs> uh, I enjoy the hands-on aspect of this class. I like getting out there and using the camera and getting to use Final Cut Pro and all the cameras. I don't know, I like being behind the scenes and being able to see it come together. Okay, there we go. I want to say two more things before I get off of here, before I say farewell to you and uh, head back over to Chipotle. <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, right behind Carlsbad High School in Carlsbad, California, Higley High School has the second best news broadcasting, TV broadcasting program in the nation. And that is, thank you, Mr. Nuttall. Oh, okay. <laughs> We've, we're also working with Williamsfield to improve their TV broadcasting. That way we can have, we can be in the top five. I want to be in the least top five in the nation by, I think we can do it by next year. So that's great. We're really setting it up also. So the new kids that walk into our TV broadcasting program, we teach them our skills and traits and skills are being passed down and passed down. And the kid who's going to be in the TV broadcasting in the studio five years from now is going to be way better than me because he has five years of skills from people passing it down. So I'm really, I'm really proud of them, and I haven't even met them yet. My second thing, for a career tech education, there's a handful of kids in the studio that have their own cameras, their own equipment, and they go off when they're not in the studio. They go off in their spare time to weddings and public events and graduations and they film, they take photos, they, they're, they're the filmers, like they film your weddings and they're only in high school and they're being paid like $500,000 rewards. So that's pretty intense. Whenever I go to a wedding, I always see like this 30 year old guy with a beard like taking photos of people he's never met before. And now it's a 16 year old kid with the no facial hair taking photos of people he's never met before. So I like that, like, we're only teenagers and we're very professional now, you know? It wasn't until, like, 2007 where CNN and Fox News, the quality of those shows, of those news shows, actually became good. If I look back at, like, 1991, like, CNN, oh my gosh. There's still YouTube videos and I, I've seen them. Uh, not good. You know, we do the same quality work. We're doing the same thing. Same quality work that Fox News Channel 12 is doing in Phoenix and their big old building of equipment and fancy tech that we're doing here down the street, like maybe a five minute walk away in this little room. So I really like that we're taking advantage of our opportunities and thank you so much to everyone here to give us those opportunities and I speak for everyone in Williamsfield and Higley High School in the TV Broadcasting Network. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my presentation is not going to be as exciting as his, but... <laughs> um, our students are amazing, and the things they are doing are amazing. And the opportunities that we have been able to give them through Career and Tech Ed is um, once in a lifetime, I think, experiences that they can then take into the rest of their lives and they learn all of these soft skills and the things that are going to help them to get jobs and keep jobs and to be able to be successful in life. And we're very excited about that. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Yes, please. Um, you know, when uh, it was specifically mes messaged that Mr. Nuttall had been here for nine years, and, and that's when I came on the board, too. And 
just the um, the passion that he has allows his students to find their passion. And when we talk about educating the whole child, and that's what that means, is that we give children the opportunity to find out what their passion is. And um, throughout that time, seeing those national award winners, I mean, I we know them by name, those of you who've been here, Sam Martino, and the, you know, year after year. And, um, and now we have students who have, I know them personally, who have scholarships to the Walter Conkright School. And those are coming out all the time. And so, you know, is, I know what you're going to be heading into in the next um, slideshow. Um, so with those pieces of why these programs are so important is, is we have to have our core academics, but we need kids to find their passion. And, um, and career and tech ed courses are the, are the way to do that. And, and you're right, they, you can come out and make come out and make money and you have your career. And that's what we mean by college and career ready. But if we don't have any career classes to help them be career ready, there's there's nothing that, that's motivating or nothing that's um, allowing them to pursue those passions. And a lot of those come through those CTE courses. So, um, we, you know, we're very grateful for um, Mr. Nuttall and that program that, and, and all those teachers that allow students to find to find their passion. I would just like to add to that when we went on a tour on Thursday, we visited the, the classroom where the instruction was taking place and it was exciting to see all the students working on the next stories and talking to the students. Um, Mrs. Reese and I were talking to the students about their next story and what they were developing and they were just there and that was it was exciting to see the uh, what was taking place in those classrooms. So thank them, please. Yes, thank you for those great words. Um, it's it's amazing. They, the opportunity that those kids have to to be be placed in positions of responsibility, where this is your show, this is your production, this is your yearbook, this is yours. Make it happen. It's great. Um, so I am moving into. <laughs> I did a little song and dance for Mr. Thomason and um, Dr. Thomason when I found out these were going to go back to back. Because I'm like, you know, look at our great programs, look at our budget cuts. So <laughs> that's what we're looking at now. Um, just so you know, in your folders, I've just got a ton of different um, funding, PowerPoints, information, stats on CTE, so you can peruse it at your leisure. The um, so let's go ahead. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try the clicker. We're gonna see if I'm good at it. I gotta turn it on though. He said, okay, here we go. JTED funding, this is our funding that is, uh, um, if the governor's budget goes through as is, this is the funding that will be cut. It is, the East Valley Institute of Technology is a JTED, it's a Joint Technical Education District, and it offers CTE courses either to, um, on their central campus or satellite campuses. We have an intergovernmental agreement with them that um, that allows them to satellite CTE programs on behalf of EVIT. So we actually have classes on our campuses, as well as the ca uh, classes that are offered through EVIT's campuses. And each satellite student here on our campus generates an additional 0.25 ADM to EVIT. So the money goes to EVIT, and then through the IGA, EVIT then pays the East Valley School Districts, 80% of the generated funding. Of that funding, well, first of all, this shows kind of the grants and funds that we receive for CTE um, support. So that's to purchase the cameras, the um, all of the equipment, all of the supplies for bioscience, things like that that cost money. We have 12% uh, of our funding comes from our uh, federal Perkins grant, 6% from our priority state grant, and then you can see that the majority of our funding does come from this JTED funding. Of that JTED funding, this is how the, um, our last year's funding was spent. We ended up spending 97% of what we spent on salaries or paying for stipends, uh, people support. So paying for those things. Then we we spent 1% on equipment, 1% on supplies, and 1% on professional development. And you'll see how this plays 
a vital role in this funding cut a little later. So last leg legislative session, the legislature and governor cut large joint technical education districts. This would be Evit, West Mech, and Pima Jated. Those are the three largest in the state. They, they cut their satellite funding by 7.5%. In addition, they cut school district MO funding by 7.5% for JTED satellite students, which can be covered, this can be covered by the JTED payment. Um, so there's a supplanting um, law that says that school districts cannot use JTED funding for anything but CTE. However, that is suspended for whatever the cut is. So whatever the cut is, the district can reimburse themselves. The cut to MNO, they can reimburse themselves out of the JTED funding. For some school districts, though, this will equate to about a 50% reduction in, in JTED funding. So JTED funding is paid to the dis district through the IGA, and not all JTEDs pay out the same amount of money. EVIT pays out 80%. That's in our agreement. Each agreement is different um, for the different JTEDs. Students enrolled in four or more high school classes generate 1.0 ADM that goes directly to the school district. And then, and these numbers are, have been rounded, as you can see. The, there's a lot more num little numbers after. But the JTED students enrolled in one satellite program, um, course taught at the home school, generate the additional 0.25 ADM, and that money is paid to the JTED and then through the JTED to us. So what does this mean to the district? And this is a spreadsheet that kind of shows what our funding was last year. And I'm gonna just go through it kind of quickly, except that, oh, there we go, okay. Oh, wait, no, okay, sorry, I'm playing with the buttons, <laughs> okay. So, um, the estimated loss to district satellite funding due to the state budget cuts. We had, um, we have a $54,000 JTED satellite funding cut and a $284,000 district m and um, fund cut, leaving us at about $339,000 for the total district. And... I don't, I don't want to push it too many times because I feel like it goes too fast. But <laughs> so the projected cut for 2016-17, you can see that the circled number is our Higley Unified School District's 80% amount the district keeps per the IGA. And then the cut to the district m and budget for, um, sorry, I'm looking up, I can't see my things, which you, it's hard to see the number in red. Um, is, show, is showing the $54,000 cut. And then you can see the ADM, cut to the ADM, is, and that's for the students who are receiving that 0.25 additional ADM, that's where that cut comes from. And what that means is, I think this thing only likes to click every once in a while. If we have $671,000 in JTED funds and we lose $284,000 and to um, M&O budget, we end up with a $386,000 balance. However, CTE salaries last year cost us $601,000. This leaves us with, even if we take the um, funding that we receive from the JTED and pay back the M&O cut, it leaves us with a $215,000 cut. So, and leaves us with no JTED funding to support the programs. So that's where we're a little concerned. Um, <clears throat> this just shows those numbers again in a, and shows the other districts, sorry, shows the entire East Valley and the cut throughout the East Valley and it ends up being a 46.77% cut to that funding. So these are just some additional resources that if you wanna know more about what's being done, um, we've got news, um, both ASBA and um, ABEC have some information. The, all of these businesses are getting together, they're talking to their legislators, they're talking, there's a lot of conversation going on about what can be done. Are there other ways that we can cut budget without 
um, harming school districts quite this much. There's a campaign, IMCTE. Um, it's got a lot of great stories about CTE successes and things that are going on. It also has an advocacy portion, so if there's any information that you'd like there. And these are some websites that are also, um, ACTE AZ has a lot of information. There's a lot of resources that talks about, talk about the stats for uh, CTE, what's good, what good is going on, and things like that. Are there any questions? Not a question, but I, I wanted to point out some of the, the fact sheets that um, some of us have seen throughout the years as we've uh, attended um, CTE meetings or um, Arizona Business Education Coalition and um, career conferences and things like that, and um, that the CTE graduation rate is very high. Um, I think 2013 was, you have 96%, but I know it was higher even in 2014, and, and our own CTE rates are very high. And, and I think just sharing the importance of what that means, um, Arizona's average graduation is 76%. And if we're giving kids more opportunities to be exposed to something that um, they, they're interested in, um, that about. keeps them in, in school, but also gives them um, a path or an opportunity post-secondary um, or post-high school. Um, so if Arizona's 2012 graduation rate had been 90%, 90% versus 72%, that would have been 164 million more in increased annual earnings. It would have been 128 million more in increased spending. It would have been 324 million more in increased home sales. 17 million more in auto sales, 1,500 new jobs, 225 million increased annual gross state product, and 11 million more in increased annual state local tax revenue. That's simply just raising the graduation rate by giving children different opportunities through career and tech education courses. To give a perspective, in 2011, the state funded 92 million in CTE courses. 2011. 92 million. 2017, 43 million. That's more than cut in, in half. You know, and, and, it's, and it's not even proportionate to what, um, you know, we've all faced as districts, you know, 28% on a district level. Um, why, you know, what's, th what's the reasoning to cut CTE so much more? Um, you know, I guess if we've all been cut 28%, then, you know, CTE, you would assume would be cut 28%. But no, that's, it's, it's more than half. Um, so I just encourage people to kind of understand what those courses mean. It's not video. It's, it's dozens and dozens of courses. Um, you know, my, my nephew experienced a great CTE opportunity in Oregon. He came out of high school making, making $30 an hour. $30 an hour because they have a JTED and all their high school share it and um, and he's paying for college because of his CTE course experience as he's going through college and it's a flexible job that he can do that. Um, so I just encourage people to be more um, involved and, and exposed to what CTE means and at the state level that this is, I mean, we can just say, oh, it's a, it's a $250,000 loss to Higley. Buck up, little campers. No, what does that mean at the community level? What does that mean at the state level? And, at, and that's, that's, the, that's my point right there, is how does this impact our communities and our state um, in, the, in the future of, of the Arizona we want? So thank you for sure, I, providing I would, all that. I'd just like to comment on that. I've talked to a number of board members around the country, and I was talking about the funding for the CTE program, and they were basically appalled that the buzzword around the country is CTE. That's number one around the country, okay? And here we are in Arizona having this conversation. And I've said this before when we've had other issues. I've said there was that old movie, I'm mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. Who are our advocates? Is, is the conversation that we are having with these politicians, is it, oh, I don't think we should cut this. Is there some truly people out there, these organizations that you have showed me, are they truly advocating for these children and voicing their opinion because these voices need to be heard and we can't take this anymore, okay? The children of the state cannot take this anymore. There's, and I know that there are some, there's a large push right now.
from all of these organizations as well as other organizations to really see if we can't work out something to it's just, do something to support it. schools. They don't get it. I don't think they do. And I, I agree that CTE is no longer just if you can't make it in college, you're going to go get a job. That's not what it is. This is this is true career is sports medicine. Um, a lot of these kids come out a lot more responsible yes. than others. And accountability, and and I think I think Higley and Miss Ward is very supportive of the CT course. We we've seen it throughout the years that they they have a different. We know it's a responsibility and accountability piece, and those soft skills that not everyone is, has the opportunity to be exposed to, or you know they might have different passions, and and that's fine. But we we do know that these kids. I mean, the responsibility piece is proven in the graduation rate. So. That's huge. President Whitener. Cheers. I'd also like to point out that the state does require one CTE or fine art credit for graduation. So they're required to take either a fine art or a CTE. And when they're not funding them, I, I mean, the state requires it for graduation. So they don't want to fund it. What are they supposed to take? I mean, we already know our fine arts is, has been hit with all of the other budget cuts and now cutting our CTE programs. What are these kids? supposed to take to meet graduation requirements. It's interesting. Thank you for the packet. Yes, you're and welcome. We Thank can you so much. Appreciate it. So you may have seen me at Chipotle, but I've been watching you guys for years. <laughs> All right, um, 9.2, um, every year we have the opportunity to, or requirement to, but we, we appreciate the opportunity to share um, our annual financial report with our community and taxpayers. And um, we can't hit everyone because not everyone is a parent in our district and all of our taxpayers. So we, um, we take the financial report pretty serious and make sure we can get that out to as many people as we can. So we will hear the update on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you all know, um, the annual financial report is very long. It's very um, numbers oriented. So I've tried to put together a very quick summary um, just so everyone can kind of get a, an overall view. So looking at our, um, our m and and our capital override accounts, uh, you can see the budgeted amount what we've actually spent uh, last year, and, and this is FY15, and then our balance that we carry forward into the FY16 year. I did want to note that in our budget uh, revision in May, um, no, I'm sorry, the FY16 budget that we did in July, we estimated a $900,000 carryover, so we were a little higher than we projected. The $4 million for capital outlay, when you say expended, it, that's just the placeholder number? That's what we spent. Oh, okay. That was the actual expenditures. On the, and you may hit it, but on the uh, financial report, will it show what, um, I, I don't think I saw it in here, but is the district additional assistance and what this state funding formula says we are to get but that we don't get? That's actually part of the budget process. Okay. So this is afterwards. So that district additional assistance has already been lumped in okay. to these numbers. So that's part of the actual budgeted numbers. And then we subtract whatever we spent in that. So if we, if, if you want to think about it, we didn't spend the $800,000 that we had for district additional assistance. So that was carry forward into the balance. Okay. Does that make sense? But the financial report doesn't show that that 800,000 is only 10% Correct, it does not. Do we have latitude to show that? Do we have what, I'm sorry? Latitude to show that in a financial report? Well, the financial report is actually given to us by the auditor, or the Arizona Auditor General's office. Mm -hmm. So we just fill out their, their pre-agreed on forms that they supply us that we're required to fill out. I mean, I can certainly put all that information together and get it to you, but that's not what's actually required. It may not be required, but are we allowed to report it? So this is the, this is the big pamphlet that's going to go out to everyone, correct? 
that we mail out? Yes, President Whitener, on the on the forms the state requires us to fill out, it does not have the opportunity to put in the placeholder of what the state allocates to us minus the reduction. Because I hear what you're saying is that you want to show that the $800,000 minus 90% just is what we're allocated. It just gives us the allocation number, not the the number that the state says that we should have, just the actual allocation that we get. But we create our own brochure. Our, correct. And can't we put that in there? Absolutely. Okay, that's sorry. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. That we can, okay, and that's why I didn't see it in here, but we can still talk about that and still, we can add that. Okay. So Thanks. we have the pamphlet that we send out um, and then this is actually just the forms that were required by okay. statute to supply to this. So this is not what's going to be no. mailed out. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any additional questions on this slide? So um, one of the categories that I know um, most you're typically used to seeing is this particular, um, the fund 001, which is our m and um, by object code. So we have our salaries and our benefits. Um, the purchase services, supplies, and other, and then the dollar amounts that total the 54, 54 million that we actually spent last year. And then looking at our Prop 301 money, um, how we, the beginning cash, the revenues, what we spent, and our actual cash balances. Now the Auditor General breaks down 301 in how much on average it goes to teacher salary. Um, it is 20% for the teacher compensation for the fund 11 and then 40% for uh, pay, per, for pay per performance and then the menu items are the other category. Um, sorry, for, for example, on the bottom of the Auditor General it says average state teacher salary from 301 is $4,500. Can that, that's an Auditor General report, but that, can that be put in the financial report that we mail out? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, thanks. And I don't know, maybe just put that whole screenshot on there, what, that one page? Okay. Uh, then we're also uh, required to separate our uh, K-3 reading program uh, for they have a separate AFR or annual financial report. So this is how we spent the money that was allocated to our K-3 program. So as you can see, it's salaries and benefits. And then we also have our cash balances for our cash controlled funds. So we have our 630, our, our bond, uh, tax credit, gifts and donations, adjacent ways, our facility rental fund, and our impact fees. And then I tried to mirror, um, and I haven't gotten the specifications yet from the Auditor General, um, but this is kind of a mirroring of what they did last year on their um, Auditor General district report. So I broke it down by uh, classroom instruction, instruction support, student support, etc. You know this year they're going, it's going to look a little different because the classroom instruction, instruction support, and student support will all be lumped together. So it'll be a little different. But this kind of separated it out a little bit more. Is that required for next year's reporting? that take legislative action? Or is it the Auditor General who just says we're going to lump it? I believe it's just the Auditor General, but I can double check for you if you'd like. I say that because I think there is an initiative to make sure that all three of those add up to 65%. Sure. And we are well above that. Yes, we are. Well, well above that. Thank you. 
And then finally we have our food service annual financial report. Um, I just kind of lumped it all together. So we served uh, just over 11,000 breakfasts and, um, in FY15 and just under 675,000 lunches. And we did have just over $150,000 carryover. Any questions? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Appreciate it. Nine point two. I move that we accept the annual financial report and authorize publication. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 9.3, we have the opportunity to discuss and approve the Expect More Arizona Partnership. We heard from them two meetings ago, or was that last, last meeting? And um, we heard about their program. I will go ahead and move that we um, approve and accept the partnership with Expect More Arizona. I'll second. Any questions or comments? So there, there is no cost. It's just a, a, a partnership and being able to share inf information regarding education. That's sure. correct. It would be the shared vision that uh, the Higley Unified School District envisions along with Expect More Arizona for the vision of, of what's on the sheet there that uh, we have the same expectations for students. And JTED's on their radar too. Thank you. 10.0, future agenda items. Did you want to vote on that one? Well, did we not? Yeah. Oh, but did I have a second? Yes. yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Stay in. Sorry. 10.0, future agenda items. Um, not immediate, but I'd like to add. Um, kind of a calendaring update, calendar, um, that we can start getting some feedback if we are liking our new calendar and how it's working with our testing and our breaks um, and, and just have that that come up that we can kind of take some anecdotal or some you know survey information of how our teachers feel and how our parents feel about the, the calendar and how it's being implemented. Are there any other agenda items? Future agenda items. President Whitener. Mrs. Reese. I just wanted to bring up um, that we may have a conflict in November for a quorum for, um, I believe we have a meeting on November 18th. I believe it's scheduled. I will be in Florida. I believe you said you would be gone. Over the 18th? Mm-hmm. So, can we look at our scheduled meetings for November? I'll be at a conference. Thanks for remembering my schedule. <laughs> no problem. Got it down. <laughs> By the way, Mrs. Whitener, you're going to be gone on November 18th. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, if we can just bring that to next meeting, um, we might need to um, yeah to change that meeting. Like whether only having four board members that right whether it's that it's a problem okay thank you i move that we adjourn second all those in favor aye 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 thank you